is love, vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood, when the prince of life our ransom shed for us his precious blood, who is love will not remember, who can see Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to, to morning worship, and welcome back to, to Frank, the Reverend Frank McKeown. Uh, Frank's conducting worship for us today, both this morning and this evening, and we thank Frank for it and pray that, that God will, will bless us as he ministers to us today. Uh, just a few announcements. Uh, we meet for prayer, as usual, at 6.30 in the Nelson Room before the service of worship at 7 p.m., then the boys' brigade will be heading off on their annual camp this afternoon. Uh, the congregation is invited to join them on Wednesday, the 3rd of July, at 6.30 for a barbecue. Um, please note, if you're able to come to the barbecue, please put your name and the number attending on the sheets provided in the vestibule and also in the, the link corridor uh, today, please. Uh, you're also asked not to arrive before 6.30 if you're attending, uh, intending to attend because the officers and boys may not be at camp before this time. And in past years, people have been very kind in providing tray bakes for the camp, and they would be very grateful for any tray bakes again provided uh, this year. There will still be a midweek prayer meeting on Wednesday at 7.45 for those who are not traveling to, uh, to Dunluce. And then Colin will con conduct both services next Sunday. That's the 7th of July, both morning and evening. And then a sheet with prayer points for the summer is available to take away today. Please pick up a copy and use it to pray for uh, the organizations and the work of the church uh, throughout the summer. And then a final announcement this morning is that Jersey Street City Mission reopens tomorrow as Jersey Street Outreach Hub. And if you're in the area, you're very welcome to pop in uh, between 2 o'clock and 4 o'clock. That's tomorrow afternoon uh, in Jersey Street. These are all the announcements. Thank you. Well, morning, everyone. Morning. And uh, thanks, Alan, for your welcome again. And I want to thank Colin for inviting me to lead worship uh, this morning and this evening. And as always, it's a, it's a privilege to be back with you uh, here in Emmanuel. For a call to worship, just some verses from Psalm 145. It reminds us that the Lord is gracious and compassionate, that he's slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All you have made will praise you. O Lord, your saints will extol you. We're going to lift up our voices in praise as we commence worship now. We're going to sing Psalm 63, singing the first eight verses. O God, you are my God alone. Let's stand to sing.
Let's be still. Let's pray. Lord God, as we gather to worship today, we praise you that you are our great and faithful triune God. We rejoice today for the joy and the privilege it is to be part of your people. We praise you that it has always been your intention to have a people for yourself. And through that people to bring blessing and life to the whole world. And we praise you that you've created us in your image and in your likeness. We praise you that you've bestowed upon us value and dignity and worth. Simply because we are made in your image. And we praise you that even right back in the Garden of Eden... We get glimpses of who you are and your plans for us. We praise you that it has always been your intention to rule your world through your king and his bride. And yet we know, Lord, that our first parents failed to listen to and to obey your word. And instead they listened and obeyed the voice of the serpent. And as they fell into sin, so too all of humanity fell with them. So we confess today, Father, that we are both sinners by nature and sinners by practice. We're so prone to wander from you. We tend to be self-centered rather than focused on the needs of others. Each of us have the capacity to be angry and sharp and rude and offensive. We make idols of our things, our money, our jobs, our children, our relationships, our comfort. We find ourselves worshipping at the altar of our self-importance rather than worshipping you, our creator and the giver of all good things. So as we worship in your presence today, we bring with us all our sin and failure. All of it is known to you. And though we may succeed in hiding it from others, we cannot hide it from you. And so we ask that you will forgive us our many sins. We also come to you today with all of our concerns, our hurts, our anxieties, our disappointments, our grief, our unrealized dreams and longings, and we throw ourselves upon you in complete dependence. We ask that you will be here by the power of your spirit. And that he will be doing the work that only he can do in convicting us of our sin. And ministering to us the truth of the gospel. And most of all glorifying the person and the work of the Lord Jesus. Lord we praise you today that your plan from the beginning has not changed. That even today, you still long to bring blessing and life to all people as you rule this world through your King, the Lord Jesus. So Father, we pray today that in all that happens in our time together, that you help us to see Jesus. Help us to magnify him. Help us to make much of him. And that in so doing, we'll find our hearts refreshed and encouraged to keep faithfully living for his glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. I'll ask the girls and boys to come to the front this morning. Thank you for coming up and joining me. Great. Super. Hiya. Well, are you in good form this morning? You are bound to be. School is finished. Isn't that right? The holidays have come. Imagine, eight weeks. And you're going, wow, eight weeks. And mommy and daddy's going, oh, eight weeks. Oh. No, it's great, isn't it? Are you in any clubs? Any football clubs? Or any of you do gym? What are you in? Rugby club. Rugby club, okay. Any of you do gymnastics? No? My youngest granddaughter is in a gymnastic club 
And she loves it. You know what that is, don't you? When you learn to do forward rows and backward rows, and you get onto the bar and you swing around the bar. And then there's thing, this thing called the beam. It's about maybe what, four foot off the ground. It's only about that thick. And about maybe eight foot long. And you push the stand on it and go straight across the bar like this without falling off it. Well, we Johnny, he was in the gymnastics club. And he loved the bar. And he could do the bar. He could actually even do the one where you hold on to the bar, you swing a few times, and you go all the way around and back around again. He's very good at that. Forward rolls, easy. But the beam just can't handle the beam. And so this gymnastics club evening, Johnny got, had another go at the beam. He got onto the top of it. And it's very narrow, remember? And so he put one foot in front of the other. Yeah. And then the other. And no, then no, no, he fell off it. Now, the good thing was there were always mats on either side of the beam. So he didn't hurt himself. But he wasn't going to give up. And so he got on again, top of the beam. And he did well, one foot. And away he went again. He fell off. The teacher saw it happening. And he thought, I'm going to help him. So he went over to Johnny. He said, Johnny, look, let me help you onto the beam again. So he took his hand and got him onto the beam. And there was Johnny on the beam holding on to the teacher's hand. And he said, this time, look at the wall there. Do you see that spot there? Keep your eye on that spot. Look down, look at the spot. Look down, look at the spot. And you'll get yourself across as long as you keep looking at that spot. Okay, I'll try that. So Johnny put his hands out, looked at the spot, looked down, 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 and he'd fallen off, and he just not walking on the carpet, and he fell off there, so it did. But he got right to the end, and all by looking at that spot, keep his eyes fixed, where his foot was being put, and then at the spot again, and so on. He was so pleased with himself. Later on that night, as you know what always happens when Johnny goes to bed, he reads his Bible and he says his prayers. And then mum or dad comes in. And that night it was his dad. And his dad said to him, well, how was gymnastics tonight? Daddy, what do you hear? I'm now able to walk on the beam. Really? Well, how did you manage it this time? Well, the teacher told me, but looking at one place in the wall all the time. And if I did that, I would make it a... Daddy, I did. Every time I got on the beam... As long as I looked at the spot, I could walk across. No bother whatsoever. That's great, said Dad. And Dad said, hmm, that actually reminds me of a Bible story. Which one, said Johnny? Well, you know the one where the disciples were in a boat, and Jesus wasn't on the boat, but there was a storm. The waves were high, and the wind was blowing, and they saw Jesus walking to them on the water. Remember, he was the son of God. He could do that. And Jesus was coming towards the boat on the water. Peter saw him, and Peter said, I, 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 can I do that? And he stepped out of the boat onto the waves. And as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus, he was able to walk towards Jesus. But when he took his eyes off Jesus, he saw the waves, he heard the wind, and he began to sink in the water. And he cried out, Lord, save me. And of course, that's exactly what the Lord Jesus did and brought him safely to the boat. Everything was great for Peter as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus. And Johnny, there's the lesson for you, for me, and for all who love the Lord Jesus. You're a Christian, Johnny. Yes, Daddy, you know that. Yeah, I do know that. And you're working your way to heaven one day. And as you make your way to heaven, day by day, Jesus wants you to keep your eyes on him. Keep thinking about him all the time. Keep trying to please him. Keep him the most important thing in your life. And whenever difficulties do come, Johnny, and they will come, as you grow older and different problems will come, in the middle of those problems especially, you keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep looking to Jesus. Keep praying to Jesus. Keep asking Jesus to guide you through those problems. It's all about keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. And that's a lesson for you too. Okay? 
Jesus is the most important person you will ever know. And if you get to know him as your savior, the one that you love more than anyone else, well then you like Peter, you can keep your eyes fixed on him day by day, week by week, year by year. And as you grow up, you know, did you know I was once your age? I mean, can you imagine that? Can you imagine? I was actually once your age, you know. But I remember when I was 14, and I was sitting in the old church here at a BB service, and I was sitting listening to the minister talk, and he was talking about Jesus. He was talking about how Jesus loved me so much. And that night, I was determined that I wanted to have Jesus in my life. And from that day, when I was just 14, until now, with his help, the Lord's help, I've been trying to keep my eyes fixed on him. And right to this moment, he's been with me all the time. Even when things were hard and difficult, he was there by my side because I kept him focused. I was focused on him. He's the most important thing in my life. He's the one I love more than anyone else. And that's what we desire for you too, that you get to the point of saying, he is the most important thing to me. I will always keep my eyes and my life heading for him. You trying to remember that wee lesson this morning, will you? That's good. Back to your seats again, and we'll sing your song. We're going to sing, Oh, What Can Little Hands Do? And we'll stand to sing. Let's come and pray for others at this time. Let's pray together. Our gracious and good Father, we acknowledge that every good and perfect gift comes from your hand. And we bring before you every family attached to this congregation. We thank you for the privilege it is of being sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers. We thank you for the blessing also of being grandparents, of seeing with our eyes our children's children. And we ask that you would give us strength and grace to play our parts well within our family and our extended families. That we would give you glory and thanks in all that we do in family life. May the light and life of your gospel guide us. May grace flow in all these relationships to build and to strengthen, to heal and to restore, and in all things may love cover over all hurts. As your people, we bring before you 
all our burdens, our troubles, our anxieties and our needs. We ask that you will comfort those who have been bereaved in recent months. We pray that you'll be a husband to the widow, father to the fatherless, a powerful presence to the lonely. Please draw near to all those who are suffering or who are weak in body or mind. Lord God, we praise you that you have not done your mighty acts of salvation in a corner. We thank you that the Lord Jesus has been manifested, proclaimed among the nations. We praise you for the gospel that you have revealed to us. And we pray for the spread of this message throughout the world. We pray for the mission of your church. We pray in particular today for all those missionaries who serve you in the world from our Presbyterian church. We pray for those working on this island for those working in other lands, we pray that you would bless, that you would prosper all their work in order that your gospel would bear fruit as it already is in many places, that the Lord Jesus would come with mighty power. We pray for our own land today and for our people as we face an election this week. Lord, remind us continually that you are the sovereign Lord and that your will will be done at this election. We pray for our rulers, for those you've placed in authority over us. We pray that you would grant them as well as us repentance that leads to life. We pray that it would be public and national, broad and deep. We pray that it would go to the heart of our nation and its national life and that it would affect our laws. And we pray that in these days, you would pour out a time of blessing, a time of refreshing upon us, upon our authorities, upon our whole people. So Father, we bring these needs, we bring these requests to you, knowing that you are the Father from whom every family in heaven and earth takes its name. The one who can do more for us than we could ever ask or imagine. And so we pray all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's pick up our Bibles. We're going to read, first of all, from Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5. And we're going to read from verse 20. Isaiah chapter 5 from verse 20. This is God's word. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine and champions at mixing drinks who acquit the guilty for a bribe, but deny justice to the innocent. Therefore, as tongues of fire lick up straw, and as dry grass sinks down into flames, so their roots will decay, and their flowers blow away like dust. For they have rejected the law of the Lord Almighty, and spurned the word of the Holy One of Israel. And we'll finish a reading there. Let's sing together again. It's number three at five in our hymn books. It's Jesus, the joy of loving hearts. Let's sing.
Again, lift up your Bible. This time turn to Job chapter 11. Job chapter 11. And we're going to read from verse 7. Job 11 from verse 7. Again, this is God's word. Can you fathom the mysteries of God? Can you probe the limits of the Almighty? They are higher than the heavens above. What can you do? They are deeper than the depths below. What can you know? Their measure is longer than the earth and wider than the sea. If he comes along and confines you in prison and convenes a court, who can oppose him? Surely he recognizes deceivers. And when he sees evil, does he not take note? But the witless can no more become wise than the wild donkey's coat can be born human. Yet, if you devote your heart to him and stretch out your hands to him, if you put away the sin that is in your hand and allow no evil to dwell in your tent, then, free of fault, you will lift up your face. You will stand firm and without fear. You will surely forget your trouble, recalling it only as waters gone by. Life will be brighter than noonday, and darkness will become like morning. You will be secure, because there is hope. You will look about you and take your rest in safety. You will lie down with no one to make you afraid, and many will court your favor. But the eyes of the wicked will fail. And escape will elude them. Their hope will become a dying gasp. Amen. Let's bow together in prayer. Let's just pray. Lord Jesus, all we need is you. And as we turn to the book that tells us all about you, Grant that we might meet you in its pages. That we might hear your voice as its word is spoken. And that our hearts may become the throne room in which you take your rightful place. For we ask it in your name, Lord. Amen. Today and for four Sunday mornings in July... I want us to consider some questions about God that need to be answered. And at our evening services, we're going to consider the majestic doctrine of the sovereignty of God. And tonight, we're going to consider the greatness of God. And in July, we'll be thinking about God's holiness, God's wisdom, God's grace, and God's comfort. And it's my prayer that God would use both series to build up his people. So do please come back tonight as we try and set a foundation for what will follow in the rest of the series on the sovereignty of God. Do return if you can. It will give you, I believe, a very clear answer to the first question that we're going to think about this morning. I want to begin by asking you, what is your God like? What is your God like? Can you describe him to me? One answer that some would give is this one. God is whatever we want him to be. God is whatever we want him to be. To be. You've heard the old story about the small boy who was drawing on the sheet of paper. Teacher says to him, what are you drawing? And he replied, I'm drawing you a picture of God. 
And she said to him, you can't do that. Nobody knows what God looks like. Then he replied by saying, well, they will whenever I have finished. So what does God look like? Can we draw our own portrait of him? And whether we want to admit it or not, we're made to hunger after what is spiritual. And behind those cravings is our search for God. We all hope for something more in life. And throughout the ages, some of the greatest minds have believed that we could experience something more only by finding God. Blaise Pascal, who was a philosopher, he added his voice to those who knew that only God can satisfy the human heart. He said this, Man tries ineffectually to fill the empty void of his soul by his surroundings. So he vainly searches but finds nothing to help him other than to see an infinite abyss that can only be filled by one who is infinite and immutable. In other words, it can only be filled by God himself. Centuries earlier, Augustine had said to God, the thought of you stirs me so deeply that I cannot be content unless I praise you because you made me for yourself and my heart finds no peace until it rests in you. And he was writing from experience. As the result of the prayers of his mother and the reading of scripture, Augustine, who was a, an immoral, he was a hardened sinner, he was soundly converted and he discovered in God the answer for the restlessness in his life. And when we turn to the Psalms, we find there the most eloquent description of this thirst for God. Psalm 42. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. Mankind is always sought after God. But in our pluralistic age, we need to ask, which God is mankind seeking? Where shall we find that God. How shall we know that we have truly found him? You see, to say I believe in God is perhaps one of the most meaningless statements we can make today. Because the word God has become a canvas on which everyone is free to paint his own portrait of the divine. Just like that boy scribbling at his desk that I mentioned earlier. So many believe we can draw God according to whatever specifications we please. Which leads us to this first question in our series of five that we want the answer. What is the true God like? Can he simply be what we want him to be? If we stand at the city hall, if we stop people passing by to ask them this question, I think you'd be amazed at the variety of answers. For some, God is simply psychic energy. God is just an entity that man has made up because man is superstitious. For others, he's whatever is more important than I am. For others, he is an inner power to lead us to deeper consciousness. And so on and on and on it would go. So how shall we begin to find the one true God? And I ask you this morning, what is your God like? The Swiss theologian Karl Barth was right when he said there are only two ways to attain a knowledge of of God. One is to begin with man and reason upward. The other is to begin with God and accept his revelation to us. And it's when we begin with man and reason upward that we get to the position of saying that God is whatever we want him to be. Whenever we begin with man, we'll uncover some concepts of God that are unworthy of him. Whenever we begin with man, ideas will be constructed from within the sinful heart and mind 
idolatrous images will be manufactured from the raw desires of the human heart. David McCulloch writes, it may well be revealed that the worst sin of the church at the start of the 21st century has been the trivialization of God. We prefer the illusion of a safer deity. And so we have pared God down to more manageable proportions. You see, whenever we begin with man and reason upward, the result is that we manufacture an idol. Our temptation is to invite ideas of God into our minds that are either just wrong or are notions that diminish him, that belittle him. You see, idolatry is more than just dancing around a statue made of silver or gold. It's constructing a mental idea of a deity that bears little resemblance to the God who actually exists. Idolatry is giving respectability to our own opinions of God formed after our likeness. Idolatry is fashioning an idea of God according to our preferences, according to our inclinations. It's purring God down to be more manageable proportion. In the Old Testament, the psalmist contrasted idols with the God he had come to know through personal revelation. Listen to what he said, Psalm 115. Our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. But our idols are silver and gold, made by the hands of men. They are mouths, but cannot speak. Eyes, but they cannot see. Ears, but cannot hear. Noses, that cannot smell. They have hands that cannot feel. Feet that cannot walk, nor can they utter a sound with their throats. Those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. Of course, there are reasons why we prefer our own ideas about God. If you remember, the Israelites made the golden calf because God seemed distant. God seemed uninvolved. And so they sought a more touchy, feely, more realistic God. And so they fashioned a calf that they could see, they could touch, they could carry. It was a God of manageable proportions. And there are so many idolatrous ideas of God all around us today. We want a God who puts up with evil. For the same reasons we do. We resent a God who claims that we're guilty of sin. We prefer a God we can manage. Not an omnipotent God, but an accepting deity committed to helping us fulfill our human desires. We want a God who is more tolerant of us, less demanding of us, less judgmental. We want a God who will not mess with the core of our lives. We want a God that is just right for me. A God who's like me. I mean, no wonder that great theologian John Calvin said that the human mind is an idol factory. It's so tempting for mankind to construct an idea of God based on our own desires, based on our own interests. And once we assume that we can construct an idea of God beginning with man, anything is up for grabs. Anything is possible. Whenever we think of the idols of our modern culture, nowadays we have a preoccupation with success and with money and with leisure and therefore we should not be surprised that a special western god as it were has emerged in the last decades this god becomes our financial advisor he's simply our consultant he's the god of the west he's the god of capitalism he's the god of consumerism and also in our self-centered culture sin is redefined as simply being a lack of self-esteem. 
Gone is the idea that the knowledge of God is our greatest goal. The teaching now is that knowledge of ourselves and of our need for self-respect should be the first item on our agenda. Those around us are saying that God's job is to simply affirm who I say I am. They are saying that my great need is not to repent, but to be comfortable with my true, unique personality. Now, there was a time when man lived to glorify God. Now God lives to serve man. God serves me as my great cosmic therapist. When I seek personal gratification more than the humble worship of my creator, I have forgotten that I exist for him, that I exist for his glory and not my own. And here's another God of this age, the God of radical feminists. Radical feminists seek to refashion God according to their desires and their inclinations. Here's the argument. God is represented in the Bible as male. Males oppress females. Thus the biblical model is to blame for this oppression. As long as God is male and seen as our father, we give tacit approval, they say, to male dominance. To put it simply, their argument is, if God is male, males are God. In order to eradicate this image, we must redefine God as female so that we've got a deity in step with the feminist cause. And there are some, sadly, religious denominations now who use lectionaries, who use hymnals, who use Bibles that have inclusive language that eliminates all male references to God. Where the title king is applied to God, they add the word queen. God as father is translated father and mother or just mother. And those scriptures are rewritten to serve the feminist agenda. And they say we can do that because God is whatever we want him to be. And yet in scriptures, God has chosen to reveal himself with masculine language. Jesus said, moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, that all may honour the Son just as they honour the Father. He who does not honour the Son does not honour the Father who sent him. My friends, the God that man would have as God offers no reproof, tenders no judgment, in fact, there's no right, there's no wrong. The word evil is emptied of all its meaning. Man's God has been thoroughly domesticated. But how? How can we accept the God of my personal making in light of Isaiah's warning in Isaiah 5? We read it this morning. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. In our day, man's view of God is this. I'm encountering an undefined being who is loving and affirming of who I am. I am a co-creator with God. I participate in the divine. Evil is illusionary. We're all on our way in evolutionary transformation. God is whatever helps me achieve my potential. God is whatever I want him to be. The truth is, such a view reduces religion simply to therapy and the study of God to little more than the study of myself. Listen to Jeremiah's description of such idolatry in chapter 10, verse 5. Like a scarecrow 
in a melon patch. Their idols cannot speak. They must be carried because they cannot walk. Do not fear them. They can do no harm, nor can they do any good. In that verse, a couple of characteristics of idols are evident. First, they must be carried. An idol allows me to remain at the center of my life and my loyalties are always under my control. And second, I can make my idol any shape I desire and yours can differ from mine. It becomes whatever I make it to be. I can credit it with mystery. I can credit it with magic, with meanings derived from my own mind. And in the end, since I manufacture reality, really, I am my own Another thing, whenever we construct an idea of God from man upwards, we must, of course, disregard any claim for truth. For after all, the God that you construct might be entirely different from mine. Hitler had his God, and you have yours. Adherents of these new kinds of faith can go on triumphantly fabricating as many conceptions of God as there are cravings in the world. Twenty years ago, we heard, oh, if it feels good, just do it. And today, it's, if it feels good, then believe it. And yet when God spoke to Moses, he says in Exodus 3, I am who I am. He did not say, I am who you want me to be. If we stop trying to construct an image of God from the bottom up and accept his self-revelation contained in the word and in creation all around us, and especially in the Lord Jesus, we encounter a God who is majestic and a God who is mysterious and a God who is holy and merciful. We find the one who's able to quench our raging thirst and we're not afraid to say that we have found the truth. A serious study of the biblical God is countercultural in our day. To be thoroughly biblical is to be controversial. It's to challenge the cultural myths that have developed over generations. It's to also to be confronted with a God who will not leave us as he finds us. That kind of God the world doesn't want. We want a God we can control. Regardless of how much we have studied the scriptures, our knowledge of the one true God is always partial. We, we know that. The more I study the Bible, I'm convinced that there's much, much more about God that we do not know. John Wesley was right when he said, bring me a worm who can understand a man. And I will bring you a man who can understand the triune God. So far, speaking to Job, we read it this morning in chapter 11. Can you fathom the mysteries of God? Can you probe the limits of the Almighty? They are higher than the heavens. What can you do? They are deeper than the depths of the grave. What can you know? Their measure is longer than the earth and wider than the sea. To fathom the mysteries of the one true God is life's most rewarding quest. And Luther was right. Luther was right when he said that even when God reveals himself, he still hides. But thankfully, he's also a God who is nearby. Jeremiah, in chapter 23, said this, Am I only a God nearby and not a God far away? Can anyone hide in secret places so that I cannot see him? Do not I fill heaven and earth? My friends, an idol is nearby. It fills merely the space it takes up because it's man-made. Only the true God is nearby and yet fills all the heavens. The true God is not only an omnipotent creator, but his essence is holiness. His essence is purity He's entirely beyond us. We have flashes of revelation, but in the end, we simply can't grasp 
what Isaiah saw when he had, you remember, that glorious glimmer of God in Isaiah chapter 6. No matter how hard we try to imagine the true God, we always fall short. And that's the problem that the world has with God. The pagan world is always haunted by the unknowability of God. Plato said, if God were to be found, it would be impossible to express him in terms that we can understand. Aristotle spoke of God as the supreme cause that all men dreamed of, but no man could know. The philosophers were right about this. Without a revelation from God, God is indeed unknowable. But thankfully, thankfully, because of God's initiative, we can move beyond speculation to personal knowledge. For the one true God has spoken to us. He has revealed himself to us. In fact, scripture pictures the one true God as being on a search mission. Second Chronicles 16 verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. The one true God seeks those who desire him. He dwells with those who are of contrite heart. Our knowledge of the one true God leads necessarily to an overwhelming sense of our own sinfulness. Calvin wrote, Without the knowledge of God, there is no knowledge of self. It is certain that man never achieves a clear knowledge of himself unless he has first looked upon God's face and then descends from contemplating him to scrutinize himself. Isn't it true as children that we receive our sense of self-worth from parents who either reject us or love us. We gauge our value from them and the other people around us. And as we develop a sense of God consciousness, we revise our estimate of who we are in relation to our creator. And unfortunately, modern spirituality goes to great lengths to show that we're all perfect that we're all beautiful in our own eyes. We are fine. So what's gone wrong in our world? Well, with the loss of the biblical God has come the loss of sin. With the loss of sin comes the loss of a yardstick of behavior. With this loss, comes the breakdown of society. And we're seeing this all around us. Some years ago, there was a, an editorial in the New York Times that reflected on the moral confusion of our world. This is what it said. This was the opinion of the writer of this article. Sin isn't something that many people, including most churches, have spent much time talking about or worrying about through the years of the cultural and sexual revolution. But we will say this for sin. It at least offered a frame of reference for personal behavior. When the frame was dismantled, guilt wasn't the only thing that fell away. We also lost a guide wire of personal responsibility. Everyone was left on his or her own. It now appears that many wrecked people could have used a road map. See, when we begin to understand who God is, we know that his involvement in our lives just cannot be ignored. His presence reveals our sinful heart for what they are. But in him, we also find forgiveness. In him, we also find mercy. The majesty of God should not discourage us, 
but rather invite us to draw near in contrition before him and in humility before him. Only a God who judges us can save us. Idols do not judge us, but neither do idols redeem us. We must embark on our journey to know the real God with these promises in Hebrews 11 and James 4. Listen to what it says. Without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Come near to God and he will come near to you. So my friend, God is not whatever we want him to be. Humbly, we realize that only what God has revealed of himself is important to us. We do not have to know all of his reasons for his opinions. I do not know why God sometimes does not deliver his people whenever they cry out to him. I do not know all the reasons why God chose this world, this plan. Other options surely were open to God. The scriptural portrait of God will not always fit neatly with our own preferences, with our own predispositions. So since it is hopeless to begin with man and reason upwards, the wisest course is to begin with God and accept his revelation to us. My friend, the God of Scripture alone can fully satisfy the hunger and the longing of your spirit. If we seek him, the one true God will give us an experience of himself. If we seek him, our raising thirst for God can be satisfied. In his excellent book, Desiring God, by John Piper, he says this, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied with him. Bernard of Clairvaux realized this. He wrote, Jesus, thy joy of loving hearts, thy fount of life, thy light of men, from the best bliss that earth imparts, we turn unfilled to thee again. The pursuit of the true God is always most satisfying. So, so grasp today that the true God we worship today is not whoever, it's not whatever we want him to be. So what is your God like? An idol that you've made up? An idol that you've created? Or the true God who's revealed himself to you in creation, in scripture, but most of all in the Lord Jesus? And day by day we're to meditate on the self-revelation of God given in his word. And we've been reminded today that God is hidden and far off, but also near, willing to meet the deepest needs of the human soul. If he stands apart from us because of his holiness, he also stands apart because of his mercy. Listen to Psalm 42. It's a personal response to God's invitation to seek the Lord while he may be found. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. May this be a true description of you, my friend, today. That you are thirsting for the living God, the God revealed in creation, the God revealed in scripture, and above all, the God revealed in the Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Eternal God, may those words describe the, the true position of everyone present in this place this morning, that our souls truly thirst for you, the living God. So is the danger we're in of making idols in our lives, which would try to push you off the throne of our hearts. You are the one true 
God. You're the God revealed to us in creation and in the scriptures and above all in your son. And it saddens us so much that the evil one has led millions and millions to make a God of their own making. A so-called God who will lead them to hell itself. Eternal God, reveal yourself in all your glory to the unsaved present here today. Reveal yourself to our unsaved family members and friends. Guide them in their search for you, away from false idols. May their trust not be in a so-called God of their own making. In the Saviour's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's finish by singing that psalm together. Psalm 42, as the deer. I just take a second just to again invite you to return to the service this evening. Um, as I say, tonight we're starting a series on the sovereignty of God. I was telling the children this morning how I was saved at a baby and Roman service at the age of 14. And not long after that, in the years that followed, going to youth fellowship, being taught the basics, and one of the basics was this, the sovereignty of God. And that knowledge of the sovereignty of God has been with me right to this very moment in my Christian life. I find it such a great strength in living for Christ when I remember what the sovereignty of God really means. And I would plead with you, especially any young folk here here tonight, to come back tonight. If you're a young believer, uh, and, and if you can, to attend this series, I think you'll find it a, a great help and, and strength as you move forward in your Christian life. So... If you're free, do, do come back this evening. Let's close with a benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore.